North Point Ministries Online. We are so excited to have you joining us today. God has an amazing word for you through the sermon that you're about to watch. And before we get into that, I just want to share a little bit of information about how to connect with us. Because we at North Point are all about connection and relationships. And we want to connect with you. And some of the ways you can do that is through our website, northpointmidland.org. It has all of our previous sermons. It has events. It has information about us, theological beliefs. Any questions you have about us can be answered on our website. Also, we have a Facebook page and we also have an Instagram page. And on both of those, you will find information about upcoming events and we want to connect with you. You can message us. You can visit us in person. We have services 10.45 a.m. every Sunday and 7 on Wednesdays. With all of that out of the way, I hope you enjoy today's sermon. God has a word for you, and I pray that this sermon blesses you. Oh, praise God. I hope you're enjoying these verses we've been looking at the last couple weeks on this simple topic that healing is God's will. It's very important because it is God's will. And I want to take you to a different verse today. We're going to be over in Acts chapter 10. And I'm going to look at verse 34 through 38. But I want to give you a little bit of a backstory before we read that. Over in uh, the first part of the chapter, there is the story of how that God began to deal with a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius was what we would call a Gentile. That means he wasn't born Jewish. So he was not a traditional Jew. He did not have any tradition uh, with the Jewish religion. But he was a good godly man. He was a praying man. And God dealt with him and sent an angel his direction and said, there's somebody coming to help you. And this is so awesome because if you read it, he actually gets, he is, he is given the information of the very location. I want, I want to make sure I find that and look at that with you. The angel says, you know, there's a, you can go right to the spot. I've got him there. He's in, here's the town he's in. Here's the address. And when the Lord's that specific, it sounds like he's a God thing. Amen? And so he sends help. And while they're on the way, the Lord deals with Peter and gives him a vision. And it's an unusual vision where he says, you know, help yourself. Eat these things. And he says, I don't eat that food. Dietary restrictions. And God says, if I bless it, you eat it. And about the time he finishes with the vision, here are all these people. These guys that were sent to get him. So they bring him back to Cornelius' house. And then in verse 34, Peter begins, you know, after the, Hi, I'm, I'm Peter, I'm here, you know. Then there's the actual beginning to share. And let's look at verse 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In a truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. That's probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And the NIV says, now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. You know what that means? He was saying to them that God, everybody counts to God. When the Lord moves, He moves on behalf of all of us. There's not one certain group that God overlooks. In fact, in verse 35 it says, But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. One translation said, God accepts every person, whatever whatever his or her culture or ethnic background. God receives everybody. A lot of people have talked about in America, the, the most segregated place in America is the house of God. Because there's a lot of churches, and, and of course we welcome anybody. And, and I always said, you know, church kind of ought to look like Walmart. Not in the negative part of Walmart, but at Walmart you got a little bit of every kind of people there. And... Uh, I, I teased badly. I was a bad boy during uh, the pandemic, and, uh, you know, it was a heavy mask wearing. And I went in, I said, well, Walmart never looked better with all these masks. That was a bad joke. That was mean of me because I was in there. Someone might be thinking that about me. But here's the deal. God's house and God's kingdom is open 
to everybody. And he goes on to say in verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. I love that. And The word you ought to know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached. And verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Isn't that cool? Peter is preaching to these guys, and you know what happened? They got Jesus, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was powerful what happened. And it all began, and it all was centered about who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. Because he referred to Jesus as one who was anointed. That word anointed means the tangible presence of God. And I tell you, I long for the anointing in my life. But Jesus walked in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said he was anointed, and he, and, and he had the Holy Spirit, and with it was power. In fact, they talked about Jesus, and they said no one ever preached like that. He's got this power that no one's got. I don't know about you, but to me there's nothing worse than dead church. Man, this ought to be a lively place. You say, well, I'm kind of shy. Well, it depends on what you encounter. Some of you don't move around. I tell you, my mom's a quiet lady, but one time she was down at our older house that we built. Uh, we built a new house. She's in the old house. It's kind of, shack, kind of a shack, you know. And she saw something crawling on the floor. I'm not going to say the name of it, but Carla, I don't like that. Let's just say it's that, those things that are long and look kind of like a walking stick that can move. And it was crawling on the floor. My mom got excited. Ah! She knocked. She's like a, a stunt man. She knocked out the window, jumped out the window and ran home. Ah! I saw a, you know what? My little quiet mama got real loud when the right motivation came. Can I tell you, sometimes we, everyone's not built the same way. Some of you, you could stick your finger in the electric socket and just go, boom. Me, I'd be going, ah, that hurt, you know. I'm an, I admit it, I'm an emotional guy. And if you haven't guessed that, you haven't been paying attention. But, folks, the power is not the emotion. It's the unction of the Holy Spirit. It's not whether you're shouting or screaming. It's the power. The power. And he said Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about what? Doing good, healing people. And he referred to all who were oppressed of the devil. Now, I want you to understand, if you've got a cold, you don't necessarily have a mucus demon. Okay? Everything's not a devil, but there is a real devil. And behind all wrong is a devil. And when we understand that, Jesus came and he began to heal people. And the reason he healed people is because it said God was with him. Can I tell you this? We've got to remember that Jesus had this vision for us. His vision for us is that we follow in his footsteps. Because we are called by God to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. We're called by God to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're called by God to do good, to heal all who are oppressed of the devil. We are called by God to have the Lord with us. When he said God was with him, can I tell you, God wants to be with us. There's one thing I long for, and that's his presence. Oh, hallelujah. Woo. I found out after a few years of marriage that Carla likes me around. I like that. She would say, you've been gone all day. I want some me time. And, and at our house, Carla's let me know that her sitting in her recliner and me sitting in my recliner with my remote. You know, men know how you run the remote better than anybody. Me and my remote and two hours of TV is not together time. Is that right, Carla? It's not together. She said, it's not together. Well, we're in the same house. Yeah, you got your mind on... The Long Ranger, whoever you're watching, you know. And, and, and see, it's, marriage is about time together, being together. And, create, and relationship with God is about being with Him. And it's His presence. If we come to the house of God and the Lord's not here, we're at the wrong address. He says, we're two or three gathered together in my name, I'm there. 
And so what do I want? I want to be where God is. Amen? He says the Lord was with Jesus. God was with him. And the Lord has that same desire for us. That's why he spoke to them in the 14th chapter of John. I've, I've preached this a lot. John chapter 14, verse 12. Remember what I said? Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Jesus left expecting us to keep the church going and keep being the people of God and keep on doing what he was doing. That's the plan of God. And I was thinking on that. And the more I thought on it, the more I realized we need to just kind of look at how Jesus does stuff. And I found an example. You know, what does it look like, God being with Jesus and Jesus being Jesus? If we're going to do his works, we need to understand how he does it. But in John chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, it's a very familiar story. I just had to, and I, I saw this after, I saw the program. I told you, I've been watching The Chosen. And if you're not watching the video series, The Chosen, you're getting cheated. It's awesome. It just really lets you see how it happened. And, and this week, I was doing our little chosen time, and here they are at the Pool of Bethesda, the story of this little man that had been there all those years. And it says, look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 5. And this was the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. And all those people were waiting for the moving of the water. I've had a a little experience with waiting rooms the last few months with my son Caleb taking him down to Ann Arbor. And one thing I learned real quick when I got there is it's hard to find a parking spot. The parking garage is completely packed at the hospital at University of Michigan Hospital. You go up in the waiting room and the seats are almost all filled. And it's sad. I mean, it reminds me of this location in the Bible. They're all there hoping to find some help. You know, it says that at that pool, there's all these people gathered around hoping that they'll be the first one to jump in the water when, when the angel touches it. Is what they saw, they thought happened. And they'd all try to get in as quick as possible. That's how it is. You go to any waiting room at any hospital, it's just all kinds of people waiting, hoping that something can help them. That's why they're there. Well, they're all there waiting for the moving of the water. And remember what it says, verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of the disease he had. Now listen to this, verse 5. Now, a certain man doesn't give his name. We don't know his. You know, in the, in the TV show, they kind of give you a backstory, which I thought was awesome. But we don't have his story, really. But we know something happened. And it says he's it's a certain man. He had been with this infirmity. He had it for 38 years. That's a long time. One... Uh, commentary said it kind of matches Israel wandering in the wilderness for the 40. It was, when you get down to the first part and the last part, 38 or so years, they went, wandered through the wilderness. This man had had this thing. And all of us know when, when something comes, if it leaves us quick, we're okay with it. But when it lingers, days and days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. It gets hard, and this man's there. But look at what it says in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, it's amazing. All these people are there, but Jesus saw him. I love it. In the midst of the crowd, God always sees us. And he saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? It's a simple question, isn't it? You'd think it'd be so, it'd almost be insulting. I'm here, ready to jump in the water. But I tell you, sometimes something can get in your life and it all almost becomes you. It becomes a part of you. You know, you've, you've had a, a pain in your shoulder for so long, it's just like part of life. 
You know, you, maybe you've had a, an issue of, of, of whatever it is, and it just become a, and he said, do you want to be well? And Because and, he, he wants to ask him, he says, I want to look in your heart, do you really want this? And you hear his answer kind of explains, I want it, I can't get it. I want it, and I want it bad, but I can't seem to get it. So it says in verse 7, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. And while I'm coming, another steps down before me. He said, I, I try. I'm doing my best. I'm here. I'm where the miracles happen. But I can't seem to get a break. Can't seem to get a break. See, there's a lot of folks struggling with life and they feel like they can't get a break just last Tuesday I think it was yeah it was Tuesday our little dryer and with Caleb staying at our house our our, our uh, appliance has been getting overworked and our dryer quit blowing hot air and I brought in the, uh, the appliance guy a good fella older gentleman told me he'd been doing it for 50 years and I, as he's doing that I says, yeah, I've been preaching for 45 years. And he says, I tell you, when it comes to spiritual things, I've been really discouraged. And I said, what's wrong? He says, well, a while back, I got COVID, and my wife got COVID. Some of y'all can relate. Been there, done that. Well, he ended up in the hospital, and she did too. He said, they put me in one room and put her in another room. We'd been there three days. And she passed away. He says, I wasn't allowed to get out of the room. He said, I didn't see anything of hers until I went to Weir Smith and picked up her ashes. He didn't get to go to the funeral. He didn't get to say goodbye. He said, we were high school sweethearts. We've been married 55 years. And I wasn't able to be with her. And uh, he says, I don't understand it. You know how people get bewildered because he says, seems like there's lots of bad people and nothing happens to them. But we're trying to be good people. He said, I told my priest, he said, I'm Catholic. I told my priest, I don't understand how good people have horrible things happen to them. He says, I don't even know. And he says, on October the 21st will be our one year that she passed away. And I thought, wow. I want to tell you something. People are going through stuff, you know. And, and I'm, I, I go back and I shared real quick with Carla what he, I think she may have heard him say it. She's just in the other room. And, and I tell you, thank God for wives because this blockhead didn't think. He says, Michael, pray with him. And I said, oh, yeah, I am a pastor, aren't I? Yeah, I, if you won't watch out, it become like, you know, well, I'm not on the clock. <laughs> it's my, you know, I'm at home. And he's, he's leaving, and I, and I ran out to the car, as he, uh, not the van, as he's putting his equipment in. I said, sir, can I pray with you? Can I tell you what his answer was? Yes, please. And I had prayer with him, and we talked. And I, but there's a lot of, I told that story to let you know this wasn't the first guy. That pool was packed with people, just like every hospital. There's people looking for answers. And Jesus says to him, do you want to be made well? And he thought, I want to, but something keeps blocking it. We well, you know what Jesus did? Jesus, in verse 8, Jesus said to him, rise. There's a man who can't get up, and Jesus says, get up. Rise, take up your bed. What was it? It's a little, it's a little mat. Take your little homemade mat. Get up. What did Jesus do to him? And his, he said, I, I don't know what to do. Jesus says, I got something for you. Get up. Rise up. Folks, Jesus spoke that faith word. I love, you know, Jesus didn't say, oh, let me pray a minute. Hold on, I'll be back with you. Oh, great Father up in heaven, if you think I should pray for him or do you think he should walk, Jesus just said, rise and walk. And a beautiful thing, just like in all of his miracles, he says, immediately, I love that. I'm ready for some immediately's, aren't you? I'm ready for God to do some sudden things. Immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Now, here's where it gets 
dicey, though. It says, and that day was the Sabbath. You'd you think, what does it matter that it was the Sabbath? But see, where there's religion, that spirit of religion, when it starts working, he gets busy. Because somebody saw him, it said the Jews. Now, talking about the Jews, it meant the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those people, those religious people. The Jews therefore said to him, who's cured? Oh, no. But, uh, yeah, verse number 10. They said, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful. Our rules say it's not lawful you to carry your bed on the Sabbath. This guy's got a simple little bedroll. But our rules say you can't do anything on the Sabbath. Let me tell you, religion, and you say, well, Brother Arp, are you saying we defy the Sabbath? I'm saying Jesus showed us that the Sabbath was for us. We're not for the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said. It was made for man. God called this, uh, God, Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And they're all upset about it. Why are they upset? You think they should say, so cool. 38 years, now you're walking, that's awesome. No. They said, what are you doing walking? What are you doing getting healed on the Sabbath? That's one of the things I've seen on The Chosen. And they really depict the religious crew and how mad they get at Jesus. They go around getting evidence of things he's done on the Sabbath. Oh, he healed a withered hand on the Sabbath. He, he healed a leper. He did all this stuff. Who is he? What's he doing? Religion gives you this attitude that the rules are more important than the people. And Jesus was there to show them that he came for people, not for rules. And they, he answered them and said, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. He says, I don't know exactly who he is. He just said, Get up and get out of here. And I'm on my way somewhere else. Can I tell you, Jesus showed us that it's not about the rules we keep. It's not about the works we do. And, and I understand that, that we should live like Christians. But we are not in a performance mode with God. You can't do anything. If you, if you keep more rules, he'll love you more. No. If you break the rules, he'll love you less. No. You, you can't do anything to make him love you more. And you can't do anything to make him love you less. We are children of God, period. Amen? And Jesus says, hey, look here. This. And, and so he told them they were going to do the things he did. So what did they do when they had a chance? Let's look at it. Turn to Acts chapter 3. One of those real familiar verses. Acts chapter 3, begin with verse 1. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That time means it's about three in the afternoon. They got there. And a certain man, once again, just another certain man, just like at the pool, there's just a certain guy. A certain man from lame, he's lame, he's crippled, from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid there daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. Understand, this man had never walked, but he needed to eat. So how was he going to eat? He's going to be a beggar. I don't know if any of you ever seen beggars in person. First time I ever saw people on the side, sitting on the ground with a cup in their hand was down in Mexico when we was in Mexico, and beggars are just begging you. It's really sad when it's a mother and a little baby, and they're sitting there with their hands up. Well, this man, he only had one way of making a living. And every day they brought him there. You know, I, I did studies on this and others have. And this man was probably there. And for some reason, Jesus had walked right by him. Maybe gave him a little money, I don't know. But didn't heal him. And you'd say, well, that don't sound like Jesus. Yeah, Don't you know Jesus has plans? Some of you have said, well, you know, I've been waiting to get my manifestation. I haven't gotten it yet. Jesus has a plan. Jesus knows what he's doing. Because he knew one day. Think about this. If God had your life all mapped out before the foundation of the world. Now, this is, this is really intense. 
But God knew before he made our planet, he knew what seat you'd be sitting in on this Sunday. He knew that your mom would be here today with you, Lisa. He knew that. Before he ever... Melanie, and this met Melanie, I can't forget her name because my, sis, my baby sister's name is Melanie. I'll never forget your name, sis. He knew you'd be sitting there between your mom and your little sister. Before he ever made the planet, he already knew this. So God already knew that two of his guys... And it's really... A, it's amazing how that... Peter and John got to be buddies because they were kind of work partners, but Peter was close to Andrew. He had a brother named Andrew, and they hung out together. And uh, John had a brother named James, and they ran together. And they'd all, they, they were brothers. They grew up, they, but they're all four fishermen. But somehow, after the resurrection, Peter and John just got really close. And they're walking in, and God knew it. And, and as they came in, look how they handled this. He says, alms. And he sees them going in, and so he asked them for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, John, with, with John, Peter said, look at us. He looks him over and says, hey, look this way. And, of course, we know what it says in verse 5. He gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. One of the big keys to getting healed is expectation. Now, he had expectation, but his expectation was for money, but he had an expectant heart. See, if you don't expect God to do anything, you usually get just what you expect. Just another service. But if you come here and say, I'm going to get something today. I don't know about you, but I came expecting today. And that man looks at them with expectation. Expectation. He knows something's getting ready to happen. He thinks maybe they said, look at us. They must have a lot of money. They got something better than money. And this is not a verse that's saying all preachers should be broke. Silver and gold have I none. This is not a poor preacher verse. I just think maybe God made sure they forgot their money that day. Because money wouldn't have fixed him. You know, there's some things we find, we got to learn that you can't just put, keep sending dollars toward things. Money can't fix everything. That money, If they gave him a gold coin, it would have fed him for a while but he'd still be crippled. But the, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He spoke the word, just like Jesus said. But I love how Peter, being a human and trying to help, it says, and he took him by the right hand. He gave him a hands up too, you know. He, he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately... There's that word again. His feet and ankle bones receive strength. He never walked, but now he's walking. He's got strength in his ankles. And look, it says, he, he, he sounds like your pastor. He's leaping up. He leaped up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Here's this man a few seconds before. He's got his cup and he's begging and he's been doing it for his whole life. Now he's dancing around, jumping all over the place, praising God, acting Holy Ghost. Ain't like a Holy Ghost guy. In verse 9, because you got to understand the temple was the center of religious practice. It was a sacred place. It wasn't a whole lot of leaping and jumping. It was all quiet. Some of you grew up in quiet churches. I can't say I did. I grew up in a full-blown, high church of God. In our church, you never knew what was going to happen. Somebody give the old woo. And somebody, I remember Benny Mosier, he'd do an Indian rain dance up in the front of the church. People dancing. In a, it was, it, I, I, did, I never went to a quiet church till I visited churches. But at that church, at the temple, it's quiet. You probably hear a pin drop. And in comes this guy like a bull in a china shop. Woo! Hopping around, having a spell, celebrating. Why? Because he could walk. And it says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. They see him. It's all right. I, you that came up this Sunday, bring a friend next Sunday. 
It's all right. This altar, we made a big old altar area where you could enjoy it. Plenty of dancing room up here. Plenty of worship room. But look at this. Then they knew. See, he still had his beggar clothes on. I'm sure the cup was somewhere scattered behind him. They knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate, at the temple. And they're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Mighty miracle. They could see it. And verse 11 says, Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. Look, he likes these guys. They're suddenly his favorite preachers. All the people ran together. Now, he'd been doing all the running. But you know how it is. Check this out. Remember that guy you always had to pass by going through the door? He's over here. And people start running. And apparently there's a crowd because we find out later what happened. And they're all running to get over to where he is. Because they want to see this man who couldn't walk who's walking. I got this, this theory. We start having some crippled people walk. There might be somebody come over to North Point to see him or see her. God won't, hey, God's got a plan. And as much as we thought, how could Jesus walk by that man day after day after day and let him just sit there begging? Because Jesus knew what was going to happen down the road. He wanted his guys to exercise their authority. And all these people gathered around. You know what happened? In, in verse number uh, 12, it says, So then Peter saw it. He responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? He said, Hey, guys, why are you so shocked by this? Because the crippled man's walking. That's why we're kind of marveling. That guy is a beggar's walking. He says, Why do you look so intently at us as though we had the power to do it? And then he begins to preach the gospel. Can I tell you, Jesus let that man sit there. You say, what a cruel thing. No, 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 it's a great thing. Because Jesus knew something was going to happen. They needed a special platform. They needed an opportunity to preach. So Peter begins to preach. He, and he made it very clear to them. We're not the reason he's healed. Don't you ever get so full of yourself that you think you're the reason people are getting healed. We pray God does it. It was a God thing. It was a God thing. And uh, he preaches. They get in trouble. You might get in trouble. You start obeying the Holy Ghost. But he got, they, and we read, if you look in chapter 4, verse 16. I mean, not four, 16, verse, four, chapter 4, verse 4. 4, 4. Listen to this. This is about the most exciting part of the story. Now, it's really cool when a crippled man can walk. And I think sometimes we think that's the biggest thing we ever see. But has anybody ever got born again? Wave at me if you've ever been born again. You know Jesus. That's the biggest thing. That's the biggest. Look at this. It says, however many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about five. Thousand. We had 3,000 get saved on the day of Pentecost. This day, that's a big old temple. 5,000 people found Jesus. Talking about a miracle. One man found healing. 5,000, just the men. That don't count women that got saved and maybe kids that were there. 5,000 guys found eternal life. One man got a healing, the others got eternity with Jesus. They found the Lord. And, the, and understand something. God has these moments in our lives where he wants to manifest himself in power because he's looking to get people into heaven. God is not necessarily trying to empty out hospitals. I believe he wants to. I believe God wants to get people healed from the hospital. But what he's really trying to do is empty out hell. He's trying to get people into heaven. See, not as much as concern. I'm for healing, and I love healing, and I'll pray over you in a heartbeat. But what I'm really excited about, 
which is somebody gets the ultimate healing. I've heard people talk about death being the ultimate healing. Death is death. It's a change of address. You've got to understand, that's what death is. It's a changing of addresses. I don't know where Harry lived, but when he closed his eyes and went over, he just changed addresses. His address is now heaven with Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's now met the person who saved him from sin. And God wants us to be open because when there's miracles and signs and wonders, it gets people to pay attention. They'd been going to that temple praying day and night, and no one went, oh, tell us more. But when you got a crippled man running around like a maniac, excited about the miracle, they say, tell us what happened. And when they told them what happened, they found Jesus. And it set them up. Oh, well, I love, you know, they're sitting there in court. They bring them to the court, and they're in trouble. I'm about to close. And they begin to say, you can't do this. We can't have this Jesus stuff. Because he was messing up. Remember, the religious crowd didn't like it when a guy carries his, his, his bedroll on the Sabbath. They don't like you breaking rules. But listen to what they said verse 16. It, this is so awesome. What shall we do with these men? What am I going to do with that Vicky? She keeps getting people healed. What am I going to do with that, John? He keeps getting people saved. They said, what are we going to do with these men? For indeed, look at this, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. When, when, when someone comes in, we pray, and the doctor looks, and there's no more cancer, or their, their legs are straightened, or their heart's been repaired, or whatever it is, it's a notable, you can prove it, you can't deny it. What are we going to do with them? We're going to praise God and preach the gospel with it. We're going to use that story. See, see, you see one of your friends, they say, how's it going? You wouldn't believe what I saw last week. What did you see? There was a person came in the church, crippled, couldn't walk, and we prayed, and the Lord came down, and they ran all over the church. And they go, Really? And they say, I know you, Denise. Where'd you get this crazy stuff? You been eating the gummies or something? No. I was, I, I was clean and sober. I seen it with my own two eyes. You can ask my two sisters. They were running laps around the building, and they came in in a wheelchair. And they're going, you saw that? And he gives her a perfect opportunity to say, that's the God I serve. You say, does that happen? Well, I was down in Southgate a few years ago. Steve Totten, was, he's a pastor. Then he was pastor at Riverview. And Steve kind of walked with a little bit of a limp. I never paid a whole lot of attention to it. And he, he'd come up and he'd stand around. And we were praying, and the Spirit of God said to me to pray for him. Pray for this preacher. You know, even preachers need prayer sometimes, I guess. So I laid hands on Steve. And... Then the Lord said, touch that knee. I think it was his left knee. The Lord said, touch his knee. And I'm saying, well, I don't normally put my hands on men's knees. But uh, if you say so, Holy Spirit. And I reached down, began to pray, touch his knee. Now, if it's a woman, I'd had Carla. I wouldn't touch a woman's knee. But since it's a guy, and I know we're I'm not going there. I touched his knee and began to pray. All of a sudden, he began to shake. And then he began to jump up and down. And I thought, something's connecting. He's jumping up and down. And then, I mean, he took off running. And the church is little, about like this size, but it had wider aisles. He ran around that place like he was in a race. He's running in a dead run. And I'm thinking, boy, something touched Steve. Go for it, boy. You know, run. I'm not. I'm tired. I've been praying for about 50 people. But he's running all over the place. He finally gave his testimony. And he said it had been 12 years he'd had a knee replacement with like a brand new plastic kneecap and knee and he had been in terrible pain since the day it happened. He said, I've not had one day without pain. I could walk, but I have not run since before I got injured. And he ran all over that and he says, and I'm healed. Last time I talked to Steve, he's still healed. I've seen it happen. 
Did that help the revival? You know it helped the revival. A lot of people came to get healed. Can I tell you, when we allow God to be God, and there begins to be notable miracles, it's not that we chase miracles, we're chasing God. But if you get God, you just naturally get miracles. That's the reason I wonder about some people. They say, oh, I'm chasing God, I'm chasing God. They're like the dog chasing the car. They don't know what to do with it when they catch him. We catch God, we chase God, we gonna be. We got to be ready for the unexpected to happen. We got to be ready to, ushers, be ready. People, be ready. Be ready to see something you can talk about tomorrow. Because that's been the problem. People come and say, how was church yesterday? Well, same old, same old. We sung some songs. He yelled at us for an, half an hour. He said a prayer and we went home. But God wants to put a story in our mouth. Oh, there's a new song I heard recently, and it's saying he's building a story. God's making a story. God's getting ready to put stories in our mouth. Because they, there was nothing they could say. Here's the guy. What are we going to do? He's not really healed. No, he is healed. See, if we let God be God in the midst, he will do things that will give us stories to tell that we can then say, Do you know this Jesus? John's telling me how he's been witnessing to repair people. People need Jesus. We live in a day where everybody's going through stuff. If it's not something physical, it's financial. Remember, we're still paying a whole lot for things. What used to cost you a dollar cost three dollars, if not more. What used to, you know, and everybody's feeling it. One thing about it. 2022 has been an equal opportunity harasser. We've been harassed. Everybody has been hit by it. But we're children of God. And this, you say, now why would God allow a man to lay by the gate for his whole life and suffer? God had a plan. 5,000 men went to heaven because of his miracle. A lot of you are saying, why, haven't, why has my healing been delayed? Well, you, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. You just hadn't received it yet. Why has it not happened yet? Why has the miracle not came? God's got, a, God's got a story he's writing. He's writing stories with you, Ray. He's writing stories with me. And he's setting us up. There's somebody... That, needs, that he wants to get into heaven. That when they hear your story of what you saw or how it happened to you, it might be your story. And as you tell your story, they go, wow. And your question again is, do you know my Jesus? What you'll find is people are already broken. People are already hungry. And they're, they're medicating with all the wrong stuff. When there is a bomb in Gilead, there is a, there is a remedy, and he's called Jesus. Now, I earlier said that um, Jesus was described as one who came anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. Then, and I share with you how that Jesus set us up when he said, the things I do, you're going to do. But there's only one way you're going to do it, with the Holy Ghost and power, the anointing. And my question before I pray, and then we're going to pray for you and, and, and let the Holy Spirit do some stuff, is do you want to be an anointed vessel of God? A lot of, there's some that say, I, I don't understand that anointing yet. Remember, it's the tangible presence of God. God and, and, and He's not just there where you feel warm fuzzies. I love it when I feel the back of the them hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The presence of God is so thick. But He wants to flow through you. His tangible presence is not for you to just say, I possess this. It's that silver and gold have I none, such as I have, I give to you. He gives you something to give. You know, Tony, I, I don't have nothing to give without him. But if he comes on me, it don't matter if I got silver or gold, I got something to give. The anointing gives you something to give. It's the presence of God. We told you the story. Well, I prayed for Tanya, and, and oil came out of my fingers. I mean, it just ran out of my fingers. She was there. We prayed, and she got healed. Healed, healed. 
She looks fine now. A lot better than you came to our house that day. The Lord healed her. Now, what is it about? He gives us a story to tell. Why did the, why, I, I don't know why oil ran out of my fingertips, but I know one thing. It sure made me know God was there. It let me know God's there. God does stuff in the house that lets you know He's in the house. God does stuff in your life that lets you know He's in your life. And the question is, do you want that anointing? Do you want Him? Or do you have a, no help on Him? I need His help. Let's pray and then we're going to let the Holy Spirit do something. Lord, I thank You. Because You're such a real God. And you're in this room. I feel you in this room. You want to release it. You want to release it. And Father, this morning I want to be your vessel. I want to be your vessel. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that God ministered to you through today's word. I hope that God blessed you and that you found some good lessons to learn and implement into your life. We are on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, we are on YouTube. These social medias, we want to connect with you. We want to keep up with you. And more importantly, we'd love to see you in person. Our services are every Sunday at 1045 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. I hope you have a blessed week and I hope that you live out God's love everywhere you go and you are a shining light every dark place you encounter. Have a blessed week and we'll see you soon.